the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. Welcome to The Marinade with Jason Earl, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. This is episode 134, and our guest is Elin Jewell. Elin is a songwriter from Idaho whose latest album, her ninth studio record, is called Get Behind the Wheel. Born from a tumultuous period, some time in the Idahoan wilderness, and some experimenting with psychedelics, Get Behind the Wheel is a personal collection of beautiful songs. We caught up with Elin via Zoom the day after her set at WMNF Tampa's Tropical Heatwave Festival for an intimate conversation about heartbreak, being present, resilience, and so much more. Everyone, it is my pleasure to bring you my conversation with Elin Drew. Hey! Wash my hands, hey. wash my sins, let me shiver in your ruthless wind. After all that, I, st- I am again having technical difficulties, but I think I got it figured out. Do I sound okay on your end? Yeah, you sound just fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for your flexibility. I am so excited to talk to you. I have spent so much time with your record. I mean, an incredible amount of time with it. I've been so fortunate to have, you know, an advanced listen, and uh, and then to get to see you and your incredible band play in Ebor City. The other night at the Tropical Heatwave Festival was such a delight. So thank you so much for for that performance. Thank you so much for this record. And thank you for spending time with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having Uh, me. That, you know, y'all were on fire the other night. It was the Tropical Heatwave Festival in Ybor City. Ybor, that that wild, magical place, um, just full of weirdness and, and beauty and messiness and um, all of the good things, and um, and you you played such an uh, a wonderfully balanced set. You played a lot from the new record, and you played uh, some of your old stuff, and then uh, covered a couple of songs. And um, and I was just struck by so much about that experience. But I, I think it's like uh, you know, it was it was a time for me. So for folks listening, like. I think it's important. I, I'm usually pretty transparent with my audience. Like I was supposed to interview yesterday in person and I I get to see your show and then I get to the hotel to go interview you. I've got everything ready. My notes are ready. I'm in a good place. I just had this beautiful cup of coffee in downtown Tampa. I'm going to to interview you and I'm so excited. And I realize I don't have this memory card that is now sitting right in front of me. And I realized like I'm sitting there and just felt so defeated, but I realized the reason why is because I'm going through a lot of shit right now. And I wasn't like, usually I'm very present. Usually I'm very good about details and very organized, but because of all that stuff that I'm going through, I've been letting those little kinds of things like they've been escaping me because I'm so focused on these bigger picture things that the the day to day and the minutia and all of the sort of like micro things that we need to deal with and need to be present for in order to function and, and, and to be professionals and all those kinds of things are just going by the wayside way more than they normally would. Um, in fact, usually they wouldn't at all. And I thought, what a perfect like, uh, you know, mindset to be in to talk to you about this record since I don't know that you were going through the same thing necessarily like it, but you were going through a lot as you were making this record. Um, And so can you talk a little bit about sort of like 
your headspace in the time that this record was coming together? Um, yeah, uh, for, well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you're going through a lot of shit. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to stay functional, isn't it? When there's so much else going on. And it is. Um, yeah, it's it's always kind of interesting to see what does fall by the wayside when <laughs> when the shit hits the fan. Yeah. Um, yeah, things that you would normally never forget are just yeah slip through your fingers and um i my frame of mind when i was working on this album was um yeah yeah my mind was in a million different places and um i i was in a lot of uh, i was going through a lot of uncertainty and doubt and grief um i lost several people that were really close to me um in, in a really short amount of time um unrelated to covid but during the pandemic, you know, so it's like on top of all of the stuff of the pandemic. Um, and, and I moved three times and, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, had, a, went through a divorce and, um, uh, and my daughter was going through a lot of anxiety and I wanted to show up for her. And, um, mm. so this album, I think was, um, it was, an invitation to focus on something that was n none of those things, but was mm. definitely inspired by all of those things. Um, it was my the album was influenced by everything that I was going through, but it was also a great escape from all those things that I was going through. You know, you, I read something where you said, uh, when I'm going through something big, I immediately start writing, which I found really interesting. And I, I like what you just said there about the idea that it was sort of an escape for you, because I know sometimes like one of the things that this period in my life has, has, uh, has done is it, it has forced me to, um, to find, to make the time to do the creative work. Like I have to make the time because usually it's just, I want to do it all the time. You know, if everything's sort of at least at some level of stability for me, I, I just, anytime I have, I want to make stuff, but in this season, and it's been almost, it's been over a year now, right out a year. Um, I've had to force that time. Can you talk a little bit about like the idea of, when you're going through something big, processing it through writing? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is or, you know, why I do that, but I've always been that way. Um, I've always kept a journal um, from a very young age. I think that it's been, um, it's been part of my process of just how, yeah, how I deal with stuff. Um, I think uh, the earliest instance I can think of, of that was, um, when my dog died and, and my dog and I were like really good friends mm -hmm. <laughs> we were pals. And I was about seven, I think seven or eight when he got hit by a car. And mm. I, I remember, um, I, I wrote a song about it. It was like, there was, I didn't think about what should I do about this? I just it, reflexively wrote a song about it and sang it while walking around the um, playground at school. And, and then I actually, I, I felt better. It was, it was really a catharsis. Um, and I, people use that word a lot to describe the artistic process, but, uh, so it's almost a cliche, but I, I think it's, it's really true for me that, um, there's something about taking what's internal and very, um, complex and something that you're like maybe overly identified mm -hmm. with and, and then externalizing it and it, it separates the experiencer from the experience, you know, it's enough so that maybe you can get a little perspective on what's going on. That's what it does for me anyway, but that's kind of um, a bit of a paradox because um, it, it takes you outside of it. It distances you and yet you kind of get closer to it because you, you gain more um, clarity around it, you know? So it's like, rather than the sixth like, storm that's going on inside it, uh, it takes that storm and and removes us from it and then we can see it better and we can get to know it better and we can deal with it better i think that's that's what writing does for me anyway and it, it's it's not something i 
I, it's not premeditated. It's just, it's reflexive. It's a survival instinct. <laughs> I love that. And I totally get that. And I'm glad you, that you you had that gift from such a young age that you were able to, to do that even as, as a kid, you know, my dogs are at my feet right now. Like I can completely relate, you know, to just how devastating that is. Um, and, and how important those best friends are. And then, you know, to fast forward and, and to go through a divorce and, and the loss that you were going through as well. Um, it's so great that you developed that early. I wish I would have developed it earlier. I wish the the writing thing, because it is true as much as I just told you that I have to find the time to do it right now. Like I have to force myself and I have these, like my, my partner's an artist. And so we, we have set aside like uh, art dates now. Like we have two nights together each week. She manages a bar. So like our schedules are opposite. So we have artists, like basically our date on on uh, Wednesdays is that we sit down, sh- we play records, she makes whatever she's making, and I work on the creative work that that I'm working on. And it's been so helpful, like so special, right? Because like, because otherwise, you know, and we have a limited amount of time together given our, our opposite schedules, but that time, it's like, that's our date. I'm not going to. I'm not going to flake on that date, right? I'm going to sit down whether I want to work on my fucking novel or not. I'm going to work on my novel, right? If I whether I want to write that story or not, I'm going to do it even though I'm not in the headspace. And the next morning, invariably, I wake up feeling better. Oh, that's cool. You know? Yeah. I love that it's social too. So um so you get like the co-regulation from each other, um but also from the art. Um I've always admired people who can create art with other people around because for me it it's so far it's always been just this very solitary thing which which is you know even though I described it just now as being a catharsis it's also sometimes living hell (laughs) (laughs) lock myself away somewhere and write songs and like you know but I've always thought it'd be so cool to create with other people so I'm really glad you have that well that's a that's a so all right, let's talk a little bit about that process wise for you, because so you played Crooked River the other night and it's one of my favorite songs on the record. Um, and I so I looked up Crooked River because I had gone in 2012, I guess it was maybe 11. I spent three weeks out west and I spent about a, about nine days in Idaho, I guess. Um, my buddy was getting married in Sun Valley and then uh, my hiking buddy who I go uh, hiking with every summer flew out to meet me and we went up to, um, the white cloud mountains and we hiked, uh, up in the white clouds. Um, we've done this every year since 2010, different hikes around the country. We always say that white clouds hike is our favorite. Like it was the, it was only a three day. I uh, usually, we, we, we were back then we were doing four or five, sometimes seven day backpacking trips. It was only a three day. We had to scramble quite a bit. Um, but there was, it was such solitude and such beauty. Um, you are, as I understand it, you're like pretty alone in the process of writing this, like physically alone. You're also going through so much emotionally. Um, can you talk about like, if you're comfortable going back to that place, like what it felt like writing these songs in those moments? Yeah. Uh, let's see. It was, yeah, like I said, very solitary. All my songwriting um, experiences have been really solitary. Um, and Crooked River, uh, the the part of Crooked River where I was would have been um, downstream from what you're describing, but okay. um, same, general, same general part of the world um, that uh, it's kind of like central and southern Idaho. Mm. Uh, it's very wild. Um, lots, yeah, very rocky. Um, this part of Crooked River has like cliffs and uh, it was really close to uh, where I was uh, holed up for the pandemic. I went to um, a little cabin uh, that, I, that I've owned for a couple years now and um, we bought it actually just before the pandemic hit. And then when we started struggling with our marriage and the pandemic thing happened and it just seemed like, I don't know, it seemed like the thing to do would be to just take some time apart, try to figure out what was going on and get some clarity. And, um, and Crooked River happened to be 
near that cabin where I, where I was living. So, um, I would pass by it a lot to go to other trailheads. Um, cause mm-hmm. pretty much it was just riding and hiking that saved my life. I think during that time, just, mm-hmm. um, I just go for like an entire day, sometimes two days just by myself out into the woods. No one knew where I was. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and I just like walked off. <laughs> Always a good idea. Always a good idea. Wander off in the woods. No one knows where you are while you're going through a crisis. Well, luckily this isn't like an outdoor safety tips podcast. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not. Um, Folks have heard me say a lot of shit that I should not have done in the woods <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> the folks do not take any of our advice about that. Don't try this at home. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and so I, I kept passing by the trailhead to Crooked River, and I'd go explore it sometimes, and then I'd sort of, you know, forget about it, and then I, I would, I would see the name again, and just something about those two words together just are so evocative to me, mm. and kind of um, got to this point where I, I started to feel like those two words were, like, um, in a way, kind of my everything that was going on, all the tumultuous stuff in my life was kind of being summed up by that phrase crooked river. So I, um, I tried writing it. I wrote tons of sketches about just like ideas, what, what it would be like, I don't know, what does the song want to be verses and then choruses. And, and then finally, I just, um, it was while I was recording this new album, um, I think we were already in the studio for it, if I remember correctly. Um, and I just sat down. I was like, that, this has to be a song. It wants to be a song so bad. I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to like make this work. I need to be able to show this to the guys and, you know, the guys in my band. And um, it uh, something about having that deadline of like, we're going to do this. Uh, just mm. it, it clicked together and it became the song that is now more or less intact. Is that typical for you? It sounds like there's quite a bit of sort of wrestling with the phrasing and wrestling with the messaging and uh, wrestling with the process as a whole. Are, are, is that typical for you with songs or do, do many of them come up sort of fully formed in your brain? It, uh, it really varies from song to song. Some of them are just intact. Like they were just, uh, waiting for me to like open the little door of the of the songwriting advent calendar and like oh there you are <laughs> and then some of them are are very fraught yeah fraught processes where it's just like I, I don't know what this wants from me and <laughs> often when that's the case when there's a lot of confusion about um what what voice I want what um what feel I want or something like that or or even just like I've got a chorus, but no verses or vice versa. Then um, often it's a deadline that will, that will make it happen for me. Like the adrenaline of literally being in the studio and still not having the lyrics that I want. Uh, It's like, I don't know what it does. So it forces my brain to come awake in a way that um, having all the time in the world to write often doesn't. Yeah. That's interesting. A lot of folks I talked to on the show, it's very similar for them. They need that deadline in order to kind of get it to that place. I, I'm always amazed by that because because to me, I, I don't mind a deadline at all in the rest of my life. Like the rest of my life, I really enjoy it. Um, when it comes to, I think it's part of why I have always made this DIY is because I don't want somebody else telling me when it needs to happen or when I need to get it done. Like the marinade has always been 100% me um, mm. other, other than my partner does the artwork. And I just don't want, I don't know if it's like a, you know, to some extent it's a control thing for sure, but like also just that creating for me, like I, I just, I think I'm scared of it. Maybe I would do great with a deadline, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I think maybe it's like a fear thing that I don't want to have to be put up against that deadline. That Mm. makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's that I am kind of, you know, and I don't, I don't mean this to sound self-deprecating, but I think just, I am legitimately kind of lazy. I am a sort of lazy person. And 
just objectively. And so if I didn't have a deadline, I would just, I'd be like, yeah, I'll just I'll do that some other time. When I, <laughs> I'd rather, I don't know, take a bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. Cause I was thinking about earlier today, like yesterday after I drove back from Tampa, having not gotten a chance to interview you cause I fucked up. I was like, I got home and I was, uh, I was tired. You know, I don't stay up that late. Usually <laughs> I stayed up to see your set. <laughs> And then I was hanging out with friends, you know, and so I stayed up past my bedtime and I was in Tampa. So I drove back to Orlando and I got back and I was like, all right, dude, you don't actually have anything you have to do. Like you really could just sit on the couch, open the book you've been really enjoying, read that book and take a nap. And instead I immediately cut the lawn. You know, it was like, <laughs> I think, I think a little bit of balance there is something that, that is healthy, right? That bubble bath is good for you. Right? It's, it's really healthy and you need to do have that bubble bath. And uh, I need to sit there and read that book and take that nap. Um, and which I did after I cut the grass, cause I was exhausted cause it's Florida and it was 90 degrees. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. I just, I think, um, that uh, a little laziness is a really can be a really healthy thing and people who tend towards laziness really do need a kick in the ass in order to move forward in life <laughs> so both you know yeah for somewhere in the in the press release or something i i picked up that psychedelics might have been uh, a part of sort of your your process in 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 dealing with things um I am a relatively new convert to psilocybin and uh, I'm curious, like for you, what role uh, psychedelics played maybe in, in your, your processing things and your, uh, and then also in your creative process. Um, yeah, I'm a relatively new convert too. I um, I had only tried psilocybin maybe one time before the pandemic. Hmm. Uh, once or twice um and i think i was i was always sort of afraid of psychedelics and, Same. and then, yeah um and then some of my one of my best friends started to really get into um this idea of like journeying on psilocybin and and i also i read uh how to change your mind by michael pollan and just so lots of different things kind of conspired to make me really curious about about what it might do for me in a in a particularly difficult place and i would say that um i think what's what psychedelics do for me is that um they well it's a, there's a lot of different things but i tend to get kind of stuck in um kind of ruts of thought and emotion sometimes i mm. i get um uh yeah I, I i don't really know how to explain it other than that just like kind of confined and constricted um and that that usually is accompanied by a feeling of like depression and anxiety that isn't really even i can't even really connect it to anything in particular it's just like I don't know. I feel this way because I've been feeling this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've discovered that just um, even even like a little microdose of psilocybin can just erase that. Those little barriers that are that have me confined just disappear, and I'm able to look at the world with just. It's not. I don't even necessarily notice anything in my field of vision, or you know, nothing. I couldn't point to anything that would was different. It just um just the the barriers barriers come down and there's just a touch of wonder that wasn't there before and that's been same. really helpful yeah, yeah. same and, and 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 it lasts for a while for me like the the effects of that you know not just in that moment but then you know for i try to do it almost like as a maintenance now i don't do it very often for me it's about like quarterly you know where mm -hmm. i'll take a little trip and and i don't like to go too hard same same kind of thing i was very scared of it or I was worried about, cause like 
you know, my experience with, with, uh, marijuana has not been good. It's never been good. I don't do it. I've never liked it. I've never been good at it. It's always made me anxious. <laughs> yeah. Right? Same. So yeah, I get like, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, and like the way people who enjoy it, describe it is what I experience on psilocybin. Like the mm -hmm. people that describe feeling relaxed or like their anxiety is melting away or them being able to process things in a more, in a healthier way. That's what I get from psilocybin. I do not get that from marijuana. I get all freaked out on marijuana and it doesn't do me any good. And I just don't touch it because of that. Um, no desire like at all. Um, Same. But psilocybin is different. And then like, it'll last for months for me, you know, I'll feel good. And those normal anxieties that I feel melt away for quite some time until that next time I need it again. And then I do it again and I'm good. And then everything else just feels more manageable. It all just feels like I can do this thing. Totally. Yeah. I, uh, I started, uh, really feeling like I needed some help. Um, when I was, I was kind of in the thick of everything. I was still grieving really severely and I was starting to have to um, tour again but the pandemic wasn't really resolved yet so it was like pandemic angst plus grief plus stress of touring and it was all just like I felt like it was totally unmanageable so for the first time in my my life I got a prescription for Zoloft mm -hmm. and I tried my best I tried so hard to make that work I, I was like I don't want to be this anxious I don't want to feel stuck like this and I tried Zoloft and I, I did everything I could to just like try to make that work. And I just hated that something about my brain chemistry and that drug. It was, it, the cure was worse than the disease, yeah. <laughs> but whereas, uh, psilocybin, it, that's the opposite's the case. It's just like what I wanted from that prescription, I just instantly got from psilocybin. So I don't know. I hope that someday, uh, the state of Idaho can, you know, think of that chemical in the, in the way that people think of pharmaceuticals, but. I hope so too. Um, I, I it seems like, uh, you know, some, it, it would take like an alternate universe in Florida for something like that to happen, but, um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, that would be great here too. Uh, yeah. The only thing that I've ever tried anxiety wise for, uh, like prescription is, um, clonopin, which, uh, which just knocks me out. So it's mm -hmm. just like, it doesn't really, you know, I've, I've tried, tried it once, maybe twice. And it's like, okay, it fixes my anxiety, but now I'm, now I'm asleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, I love, so the record, is absolutely wonderful. Get behind the wheel. It's just absolutely fantastic top to bottom. And, um, I Thank love you. you're welcome. And I, and I really appreciate this, this record. And I hope folks listening are picking it up and, and enjoying it after they hear this, if they haven't already, it, it opens with a live, which is like such a banger. I love it. Uh, it's like, you know, I, like I said, I've spent a lot of time with the record and I'm always excited when I get back to a live because I listen to things on CD. So um, cool. yeah, yeah. So I'm letting the whole thing spin and then I get back to a live, uh, and it opens up with just such a, um, I, I love the imagery, like fill up my glass. I want more. I run on these fumes, accelerators floored. You say you want to kill your thirst, but the flask is cracked. How are you ever going to quench it like that? That particular song, can you talk about that song and sort of its space on the album? Cause I feel like it's a perfect opener. Yeah, that, um, let's see, that song, I agree. I, I think it, it kind of sets the stage for the rest of the album because to my ears anyway, and in, in my head, it's an album about self-transformation. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it all started with me was um, feeling like I was thirsting for more and the way that I was, um, the way that I was going about getting my thirst quenched was through, um, through staying extremely busy, like pedal to the metal, accelerators floored, uh, and never, so never having time really to myself, um, and also drinking a lot. Mm. So 
it's um it's in a way it's a very literal uh couple of lines um but i think it's um i think that there's a a, a bigger metaphor in there for uh for a lot of people a lot of aspects of life it's like we're we're just running so hard in one direction and thinking that we're gonna like get to the place you know get we're gonna finally reach that goal we're gonna I don't know be that person we're gonna I don't know lose x amount of weight and then we'll be happy and then we get there and it's like oh that it's like just mm. out of reach mm. and um because it's like fundamentally uh kind of a well it's everything's impermanent so by the time we get to the end what we think is the end there's this other horizon and i so i wanted to kind of i wanted to sing about that feeling um of realizing that that what i the way i'd been going about things was sort of empty and then I wanted to, to talk about how like if you if you let go of all that you there's a I don't know I mean even if just to realize that that's what's going on there's a huge freedom in that and it can really make a person come alive wake up you know just just to even look at the flask and say oh it's cracked oh everything there is kind of an emptiness to everything and um that that's sort of that's the beginning of uh self-discovery i think it's just to take a look and say oh this is this is what's happening and um all my striving is uh has been uh it's it's been striving in the wrong in the wrong ways mm, wow that's wonderful um I'm interested in what you've learned through the through all of this, through the 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 heartache and then the you know the processing it, the the making of this beautiful record uh, as part of that sort of process and recovery from from the hard times. And now you're on tour, your tour manager and drummer. I'm not sure that that combination is a great idea, but it seems to be working for you, by the way. Uh, is also your next husband. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, maybe maybe if I was advising, I wouldn't say do all of that. I don't know. It's not my place, but I am really interested in the fact that you're making it work clearly, right? And and on stage, it comes through with an incredible chemistry. Your who's your guitar player, by the way? Oh, uh, that's Jerry Miller. He's so good. He, yeah, he's amazing. He's been with me since the very beginning. Okay, he's fantastic, and um, and so I'm interested in that though, like. The relationships and lessons you've learned about relationships through all of this there has to be some really good stuff you've been able to to process in mind yeah i guess i've learned that um that it it doesn't really have to make sense on paper because like yeah i agree i would never i would never prescribe that for anybody like yes have your ex-husband be your drummer and your tour manager you know the more combinations the merrier right uh, in respect i would say actually the, the fewer combinations the better it's just <laughs> easier that way um but yeah I, I do feel really grateful that that it's working so well for us i think we were we always were really good friends and we always were really good uh, business partners and um I think that that those areas are were where we have shined, and uh, it's it's great now just to be able to focus on on the friendship and the business relationship and co-parenting and um and this this quartet now I think it is this is my favorite lineup, um, and I don't mean to diss on anybody else who's been in the band, but we've had um this is our third bass player the bass player is the only that's been the only change in personnel. So Jerry's been with me from the beginning on electric guitar and Jason on drums. Uh, we, we basically uh, grew the band together from, from the, from square one. And so this is bass player number three, Matt Murphy. And he's just the, 
the chemistry between the four of us is just like we're family now. I could I couldn't imagine um, a better group of people to tour with. So, and you know, you don't even really know until you start traveling with someone what they're mm. gonna be like. And by then it's too late. Like you're just, you're in it. <laughs> so right. that's just dumb luck. I think I I've stumbled upon an excellent combination of humans and, and I, I just am very grateful. That's awesome. Well, speaking of excellent combinations of humans, well, uh, the record was co-produced by the great Will Kimbrough, who's uh, been a guest on this show. Um, we, it's like a little Will Kimbrough universe, I think, the marinade is. like He's given so much that we've had Todd Snyder on, we've had Hayes Carl on, um, we've had Will. Can you talk just briefly about what it was like co-producing with Will? Yeah, so I had never really produced um, or never really had a producer. I've always produced mm. my own albums. Um, so I was both really curious and really scared to try that for the first time um i but i think it was curiosity that won um because obviously because we decided to have him on and uh this is not since sorry she was fighting with her brother so (laughs) she's part of the podcast now (laughs) she's adorable oh um so i so will was recommended um by some people you know, mutual friends. And he's like, he's amazing. He's people said that he would be the best fit because he's so flexible and easy to work with. And I, you know, I was so nervous about even having another cook in the kitchen. Um, My band and I co-produce our albums and we do it very drama free. And I've, you know, I've always loved anything that can be drama free (laughs) that wins in my book, but yeah. Uh, but I was wanting someone to kind of, um, I don't know, just be another set of ears on the project and see what surprising directions we could go in, you know, that we'd never tried before. And so what we did was it was kind of a hybrid. Uh, my band and I produced, co-produced the uh, basic tracks. We laid all those down in, in the Boise area. And then once we got those intact, I took the basic tracks to Will in Nashville and he and I um, did the kind of the flourishes, the finishing touches. And, but also some of the songs, um, Will was like the mastermind behind. A much longer song when I brought it to him, it kind of meandered. Cause we, we did it in one take. We didn't know the song. We were like making it up as we went. So there's a you, whole you middle. You lagged for a second there. What, what song was that? Oh, Alive. Oh, yeah, we it was a meandery kind of song because we did it in one take and we didn't know the song. We were inventing it as we went. So he he kind of spliced together uh, the, the best parts of the song, took out a meandery, if that's a word, middle part. And uh, so some of some of the songs had, you know, they benefited from his his genius like that. And um, and then he overdubbed a lot of great guitar work on everything um one thing that i never would have thought of was baritone guitar how much it sounds like a horn and i he had a baritone guitar part to show me and i said well where did you get the horn he's like oh no no, that's the guitar mind blown that's amazing that makes sense i mean he's just he's somebody special you know like that's awesome i'm so glad that i'm so glad you found that collaboration that you're able to keep it as, as your record. And, and the thing that, and then that's what he seems to do with people too, is like, it's, it's going to be your record. You know, I mean, you listen to a Will Kimbrough produced record. It doesn't have obvious his fingerprints on it. So that's why I, I was interested in that question because it, like, it's not, you know, some folks you listen to and you know, it's produced by X person. Whereas with his records that he produces or co-produces, it's not like that. Totally. Yeah. 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 Some people have a really heavy handed way about it, but yeah, light touch that worked out great for me. Cause I think I would have probably had a conniption if someone was too heavy handed for me. Um, this has been so great. We usually end quickly. We only have a couple of minutes left since this is so DIY. We usually end with, um, what, uh, you're getting down on the art that has you inspired at the moment. You've been listening to anything or reading anything that has you inspired. Oh TV boy! Show. Well, 
Uh, we talked about psychedelics. I've been I've been reading a lot about um, well about the uh, the Merry Pranksters. Mm. <laughs> I read the Electric Kool Aid mm. Acid Test for the first time recently, and now I've moved on to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, and mm. um, I just I'm really intrigued by that that time in history. You know, it was the first group of people to to have psychedelic experiences uh at least you know with lsd it's very interesting very uh a lot of i think a lot of music would not have been made without that particular moment in time that's awesome yeah if you ever have a, a chance and you want to listen to my show at all listen to my conversation with steve uh silberman who uh was alan ginsburg's ta so um it's it's a great oh. listen and like steve's awesome guy He's like a, a Grateful Dead historian and uh, wrote a book about autism and just a fascinating guy. But I got to pick his brain about Ginsburg a little bit, which was really cool. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. really cool. Elon, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your flexibility and understanding. And thank you so much for your beautiful record. Oh, thank you. Thanks for your support. And um, yeah, what a fun conversation. I, I'll i chat with you anytime. That Let's do sounds- it again. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Y'all be safe down the road. All right. We'll do. Take Elon Jewel, y'all. Thank you so much, Elon. Thank all of you for listening. ElonJewel.com. That's E I L E N Jewel.com for all things Elon. The song you're hearing in this episode is Crooked River from the album Get Behind the Wheel that we talked about so much. Give that whole thing a spin, y'all, and pick up a physical copy. It's absolutely beautiful. MarinadePodcast.com for all things the marinade, including written pieces, photography, our much in need of updating online store and more follow us on instagram tiktok spoutable and twitter subscribe and give us a five-star rating on your podcast app please do all of those things they're free tell a friend about the show also free these are all free and you can support the marinade in that way if you really like what we're doing i'm gonna make an extra push for the patreon right now we have a patreon patreon.com slash marinade podcast where you can support the show financially y'all we got approved to cover bonnaroo fucking bonnaroo kung fu kenny's playing tyler childers morgan wade like a cool opportunity but your boy is a teacher like i can pay my bills don't get me wrong but i don't have all that extra cash laying around to just up and go to bonnaroo so if you can swing it we'd really appreciate it we have all kinds of patreon exclusive content over there like our show jason's journey where i talk about the moments that shape my creative life and provide a window into the process of making the marinade we also have a show called what we're getting down on which is a conversation between me and my great friend peter haroldson it's funny it's mostly light-hearted And we just talk about, you know, we have different interests, but also there's an intersection there of our interests that's, uh, I think, really valuable. um, For It's definitely valuable for us, and and hopefully folks are having fun listening to it. Sometimes we have our show Inner Child, where I will uh, ask our guests to kind of stick around for a little while, and I'll ask them, like, childlike questions, such as favorite food, TV show, you know, dream car, silly stuff like that. Um, If you want to support the show financially and send me to Bonnaroo, but you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, you can Venmo or PayPal us at The Marinade. All the money goes right back into the making of the show. Right now, that means saving up to cover festivals like Bonnaroo, like I said. And uh, we've been invited to some other cool events that I'd love to go to. Uh, You know, I, I, I just greatly appreciate everybody who listens. If you can swing it financially, we really appreciate it. But thank you so much for listening. Y'all, um, this is such a personal thing for me. I, I mentioned during this episode that things have been tough for me in the last year. Um, and I talk a little bit more about that on the Patreon. But but please know that I'm really fortunate. My partner in life is a huge support. I have amazing friends. I have a job. I have two perfect dogs. I have this show that gives me so much and all of you who give me so much. Um, This has been the toughest 12 months of my life. Uh, It truly has. As I look back on it, I've had some tough times in my life. This has been the toughest. But ultimately, I'm all right. And I'm, I'm truly grateful 
for my life and my experiences. And above all, you know, thank you again and again and again for for listening to this show, spreading the word about the marinade. It gives way more than I do to it. It it gives me more than I put into it, and I'm that's why I continue to do it. And I'm just so thankful. Until next time, go out and create something. Cheers, y'all.